Welcome to my talk, Understanding Psychological Flexibility, with some amazing collaborators, Dr. David DeSabato, Dr. Fallon Goodman, and very soon to be Dr. James Dorley. We've spent five years trying to understand psychological flexibility and improve the measurement of this construct because we found some, some flaws in the literature that I wanna talk about. This is essentially for the past 10 years, one of the hottest topics in psychology, particularly clinical psychology, um, often under the name of emotional agility, flexibility, or psychological flexibility. And just to give you an idea of like what this construct is, let me bring you back to my first year of graduate school. And I was running group treatments for depression. And it was the third session of the very first group I ever ran. And Stephanie, my co-facilitator and I had asked all of the clients, you know, whether they did the homework. And this one woman just jutted into the conversation and said, I'll tell you what I did. I walked around the house, I had a fly swatter. And every time I saw a bug, I would go, die Todd, die Todd die. Yeah, I didn't do any of the homework. And she stopped. At this moment, the other group members, just want to remind you, this is the third therapy session I've ever run in my life. They're all looking at me, wondering what I'm going to do. Stephanie's looking at me, wondering what I'm going to do. Heart speeding out of my chest, hands dripping with sweat, and a whole number of options pop into your head instantaneously. You have this thought, well, I can avoid this situation. I could take a break. I could go into the break room, whip out a flask, take a couple sips of bourbon. I could crack a joke. I could distract like I did with my kids when they were toddlers. Or I could white knuckle this thing. It's stressful. Just remind myself, I'm here. It's not about me. I'm here because I care about people and I want to improve their mental health, but it's going to suck. Or I could go the mindfulness and acceptance route and I could say, hey, all this physiological arousal, all this anxiety, this frustration, this anger, this is, this is normal. It would be non-human, subhuman not to have these ugly experiences going on right now. Or I could level up even one step further. This, this is like the quintessential moment for a therapist that I can now take advantage of. I could ask some deep probing questions. Hey, um, when you made that comment, what was your intention? Let me describe some of the emotions I'm feeling right now. How does that fit with what you were trying to accomplish? When you make people feel this way, which makes them wanna take a step back, how is this helping you pursue your goals to try to have deeper connections and greater intimacy in your life? That kind of, that kind of, that kind of statement that you made, does it bring people in? Does it push people away? What are your thoughts about that? Harnessing, harnessing the anxiety, revealing the vulnerability that you're experiencing this physiological distress. It's different from avoiding. It's different from tolerating. It's different from accepting. This is what I would call is the province of psychological flexibility. The ability to pursue what you care about despite the presence of pain. Now, this builds off of a a huge corpus of work by Stephen Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Kirk Strozel, their students, their collaborators, people inspired by them. It's led to a body of interventions called acceptance and commitment therapy to try to improve mental health and improve, improve well being, often called third wave therapies, mindfulness and acceptance therapies. In all of this work, the basic research, the interventions, Either the target ends up being to make people more psychologically flexible, pursue what they care about despite the presence of unwanted thoughts, feelings, sensations, and memories, or that the mechanism, the thing that makes these interventions work is that we make people more psychologically flexible 
and they experience less distress, less psychopathological symptoms, fewer emotional disorders, recover more easily from trauma, stress, and adversity. Here's the problem. Almost all of this work over the past 15, 20 years has hinged on only one or two self-report trait scales. That's a lot to ask for two self-report measures. Based on the evidence, I'm gonna argue that they haven't done a good job. Those measures are not measuring psychological flexibility. And thus, we have a little bit of a literature, a large body of literature that's contaminated by poor measurement. We spent half a decade trying to resolve this problem. This talk is about what we discovered. We think we found a, a possible solution. Let me share a slide that Steve Hayes often gives in talks and I stole it from him. Um, I saw this when I was first, when I was a graduate student and I was kind of mesmerized by it. Based on a, a, a measure of psychological flexibility he created with his peers, Frank Bond and others, the acceptance and action questionnaire, often known as the AAQ, they said, listen, we've had this crazy level of findings that the less psychologically flexible you are or the more psychologically rigid you are, you have all of these problems. And this animation pops out Psychological inflexibility is related to almost everything. And it's really compelling. And it kind of was like, well, this is something I've got to study. We got to be working on this. And as you kind of develop your career and you, you think with a little more healthy skepticism, you're like, if a measure relates to almost everything, that sounds like pretty poor discriminant validity. Is it distinct? from all of these things it's related to? Is it distinct from psychological distress? Is it distinct from emotional impairment, social impairment, psychological difficulties? Um, let me give you a teaser. The answer is no, that these measures, unfortunately, from a, a small body of work that's growing that we have added to show that that the scales, that the best, most widely used scales of psychological flexibility are essentially proxies for negative emotionality. And if you look carefully at the item content, it starts to make you realize, you know what? They might be described as measures of psychological flexibility, but they might not be doing the job of measuring what they say they do. Just take a couple of looks at the items. That wasn't a good sentence. Take a look at a few of the items of the acceptance and action questionnaire and the new version, the AAQ2. Emotions cause problems in my life. Go back to that definition by Steve Hayes and colleagues about psychological flexibility. The ability to pursue what you care about despite the presence of pain. The ability to modify your thoughts and behavior to match the demands of a situation. It's one of the other definitions that um, John Rottner, Rottenberg and I talked about in our work. The ability to match situation demands to get the best possible outcome in a situation. Emotions cause problems in my life. That's pretty much talking about you have problems in your life. That's impairment. And you're saying the cause is emotions. It's a double barreled question. And neither part is actually this thing called psychological flexibility. It's actually a strange freaking item. Next one, it seems like most people are handling their lives better than I am. Well, this item isn't even asking about you. This is asking about you looking at other people and say, hey, as a social comparison, is their life, in terms of how they're dealing with life, is it different from me? And is it better than me or worse than me? Again, nothing to do with psychological flexibility. You're talking about how you are evaluating yourself compared to other people. And if you look at the other most widely used scale, the multidimensional experiential avoidance questionnaire, you got other kind of weird, weird problems. I won't do something until I absolutely have to. Not necessarily pursuing what you care about despite the presence of pain, because it's got nothing to do about what you care about. You might, but maybe you don't do something 
because you're not interested. And if you're forced to do it, then you'll do it. It's a different construct. Next item, the key to a good life is never feeling any pain. Well, this is about your personal definition of what, is, what constitutes a good life and whether in this definition that you have of a good life, your, how you feel pain is in there. It's not about psychological flexibility. It's about basically about like, what are your definitions about psychology, psychological constructs? So we want to create a measure that actually measured the thing it's supposed to be measuring. We call it the Personalized Psychological Flexibility Index for good reason. We spent half a decade working on this because we think science should be slow and comprehensive to really capture precisely the exact thing that matches the theory that you're trying to study. Seven studies, working Americans online, adults in the community coming to our research laboratory. We interviewed them. We had them take performance tests. Um, we deconstructed their everyday lives using daily diary methodologies. We followed them for six months in a future talk. We're collecting data right now about what happens two years later. This is not just a cross-sectional survey. What makes our scale unique is we match it to the definition of theory. The first thing people do is provide an ideographic personal description of the meaningful goal pursuits or strivings that is driving their behavior in life right now. What's describe the most meaningful pursuit or goal that you're working towards. They've got an open-ended space to write that in and all of the other questions are key to their, their valued goal pursuit. This is what the other measures don't do. It's not contextually driven. It's not contextually sensitive. It doesn't matter whether you avoid, accept, or harness, or tolerate negative emotions, bodily sensations, if it's not in the pursuit of something you care about. You got to have the pieces in there or you're not measuring psychological flexibility. We had a huge pool of items to capture multiple ways you can respond to the uncomfortable things that appear in your head and your body while you're pursuing your valued goals. And we use multiple methods, which I'm gonna show you is incredibly important if you're doing scale development. We have to stop doing a few studies of trait scales related to other trait scales. That's not humanity, that's people describing their general vision of what they may or may not be doing. And as we know from Dunning-Kruger effects, people tend to have pretty um, illusory visions of what they are compared to what they actually do. So based on a factor analysis across these seven studies, um, this has been published uh, this year, 2020, in Psychological Assessment. You can see all the cool factor analytic data all the fit indices that we found three factors. One way that you can respond to the unwanted thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and memories that pop up as you're pursuing valued goals is avoidance. An example item, when I feel stress pursuing this goal, I give up. Imagine your goal is to be compassionate and present when your kids ask for your attention. You might, you might avoid the uncomfortable emotions, the anxiety of being vulnerable, of disclosing things about yourself as you're trying to pursue that goal of being compassionate and present with your kids. Or you might be accepting. Here's an example item. While pursuing this goal, I try to accept my negative thoughts and feelings rather than resist them. We found that this is relatively independent from avoidance. This is pretty important because a big body of work measures of mindfulness, measures existing of cognitive fusion, um, measures, measures of capturing kind of, of, of emotional rigidity, but they often treat this avoidance is just the reverse scored items of being accepting. Well, we found actually in seven studies that these are, these are relatively independent with different correlates and consequences. But then there's another level you can go above acceptance, harnessing. And this is not in the literature. People aren't talking about this except in social psychology. 
June Gruber, Maya Tamir, Brett Ford, um, these female scientists studying emotion regulation talking about sometimes your negative emotions are not something just to accept. This is the fuel, the energy that drives you to devote more effort and make more progress and be more successful at the goals you value. Here's an example item. When people distract me from this goal, I use my anger. Well, actually, hold on. Let's move my little image here. Ah, we'll go back. When people distract me from this goal, I use any anger that arises to stay focused. It's not I want to get rid of my anger. It's not that I accept it. This is energy. I'm going to take this feeling that often arises when something obstructs our goals, when often arises when people don't create sufficient boundaries between themselves and us or, or their obligations that they're imposing on us. This anger, I'm going to use this and it's going to drive me to go further. It's a different psychological reaction to the uncomfortable stuff that arises during pursuing goals. Now, I mentioned that these other existing widely used scales, the acceptance and action questionnaire too, the brief multidimensional experiential avoidance questionnaire, there's some data that these measures are essentially measuring negative emotionality. Well, we wanted to see if we could replicate this work in our own study. So we did a, a, pretty, um, a pretty intense test. We threw everything into an exploratory factor analysis. We threw the two most widely used psychological flexibility scales into a factor analysis with three measures of negative emotionality or distress, patient health questionnaire, um, big five inventory, negative emotionality subscale, and just a measure of the, the brief mood introspection scale about unpleasant feelings in your life. And we threw in the three subscales from the Personalized Psychological Flexibility Index, the PPFI. Here's what we found, it's pretty freaking cool. The most widely used psychological flexibility scales, they didn't load on a separate factor from the distress tales, they loaded on the same factor. One big factor, supposedly psychological flexibility scales, measures of negative emotionality, all loading together, and all the three subscales of the PPFI loaded on a separate factor. Our scales only correlated negative 0.4 with this distress factor. The other scales appear to be proxies for distress and discomfort. And if it's a measure of negative emotionality, distress and discomfort, you can't predict distress and discomfort. You can't predict psychopathological symptoms. You can't predict the presence and absence of emotional disorders because it's a tautology. The IV and the DV, DV are essentially measuring the same thing. Our scales are not. Now, if you look at a noble logical net, your basic scale development approach, how do our scales, subscales, and the total score correlate with other related constructs? You find everything relates as you expect. The more psychologically flexible you are on our scale, the more gritty you are, the more meaning and purpose of life you report, um, the more self-control, the more tolerant of distress using other scales, and pretty cool, all of your basic psychological needs for autonomy, for a sense of competence, for mastery, that's that primary need to feel a sense of belonging, they're all higher if you are higher on psychological flexibility. Now, let me point to the column in yellow. Harnessing has almost no relation with these other trade scales. This is worth a deliberate pause right here. Most scale development papers stop with a couple studies of trait measures related with trait measures. If we didn't do a multi-method approach, you would stop here and you would say, let's get rid of the harnessing subscale because it's irrelevant, it doesn't predict anything. And as you're gonna see in the next couple slides from our data, you would make erroneously making a type two error because you've limited your methodology to only self-report trade scales. A lesson of let's not evaluate or decide the quality of an assessment device if we only have the measures limited to self-report trade scales. 
Because when you move to a day reconstruction method, we ask people, think about yesterday, your whole day and break it into three to four episodes. And you, you personally define them. So maybe yesterday was you woke up and you helped your kids get into a virtual classroom. I've got three kids, that's a pretty big episode. This is what it's like in the land of COVID. Maybe your second episode is having lunch with one of your close friends, two hours of deep conversation. Maybe your third episode is going to the gym, um, some personal time, some meditation reflection time. Maybe your fourth episode is you had a couple people over, socially distanced, everyone's wearing mask, fire pit on your driveway with little bourbon. The odds are is you're going to act differently a little bit in each one of those episodes. Now, each one of those episodes, you could ask some questions. What happened? What did you experience? How did you regulate, if at all, any negative emotions that arose? Use this methodology of dissecting everyday life. Look at what happens with harnessing now. We moved away from those crude trade scales. Now, harnessing this way to every single um, emotion regulation strategy measured, except for relaxing and accepting. Exactly what you expect from a psychology flexible person. They show a wide range of emotion regulation strategies, and so they do not limit themselves to singular approaches to dealing with the complex stressors and uplifts and hassles of everyday life. That's what we would expect a psychology flexible person to look like. And for the acceptance, using that as a regulatory strategy, as a measure of construct validity, our acceptance subscale has the highest correlation with the use of acceptance. Notice how avoidance has no relation with acceptance. We have to realize that reversing, treating two dimensions as if they are polar opposites on a singular continuum is something that has to be tested and cannot be assumed. Avoidance is not the opposite end of acceptance. They're different creatures, different ways we can respond to the content inside our head and all of the complexity outside in the real, the external world, including other people. But we use other methods as well. We did a semi-structured interview based on the life events difficulty schedule by Brown, also used by Lauren Alloy and her team. And we added an emotion regulation interview. After people reporting all of their stressors that happened in the past few months in an interview, we asked them how stressful it was. And we asked them, um, what did they do with the uh, unwanted emotions that arose with those stressors? And then we followed them six months later. And this is just one of a number of moderation effects that we found. The question was this, for people that experience intensely stressful life events, if you are a highly psychologically flexible person, do you experience greater well-being or greater equanimity in the months in the aftermath of stressful events? And our data show yes. You can see here is that at high levels of stressfulness of these events, if you are low in psychological flexibility, compared to high, you experience um, a greater dissatisfaction with your ability to satisfy the need to relate to other people or feel a sense of belonging. Or another way of saying that is if you are a highly, sexu uh, highly psychologically flexible person, when you experience high levels of intense stressors in your life, you showed no difference in the ability to satisfy the need to belong compared to people who experience low levels of intense stress in their life. They showed equanimity. This style of being able to accept and harness the stress while pursuing valued goals made them look the same. People who experience high levels of intense stress and low levels of intense stress. Pretty cool over a six month period. So just to summarize, um, a decade ago, 10 years ago, John Rottenberg and I published a paper saying psychological flexibility is a fundamental aspect to health and well-being. Um, 
In these 10 years, we've been thinking a lot about this and our research team wanted to devote um, a half a decade to improving assessment techniques because it's been a primary target of interventions. But the whole field has been contingent on only a few scales that appear to be suboptimal. The existing measures of psychological flexibility, the AAQ and its, its companion, the AAQ2, the multidimensional experiential avoidance questionnaire appear to really be measuring the outcome, negative emotionality, distress, emotional difficulties. You cannot say psychological flexibility serves as a protective factor against distress and psychopathology and emotional disorders if it's actually measuring emotional distress, psychological problems, and psychological impairment. And that's what it appears to be measuring. We've got some, a flawed foundation for this body of literature in acceptance of commitment therapy and contextual behavioral science. And we think part of it is because the measures have not matched to the theory, which is so rich. It's not just about being able to accept and harness the stress. It's in the pursuit of valued life aims. You have to have the personalized valued life aims in that measure. To do that, you can't just ask, give everyone a one to 10 a question on a one to 10 scale, you have to extract what are you striving towards? What is a valued goal to you? And then key up the items to that. Maybe we should have more ideographic measures that exist in the literature. The beauty of this is you don't have to create a new version of the PPFI for people experiencing infertility. You don't have to create a new version of the PPFI for people experiencing trauma or people experiencing stigma or people experiencing racism or sexism or ageism or homophobia or eating disorders or trichillomania. Every one of the things I described, there's an AAQ version that is targeted that domain. Instead, create a, a scale that is sensitive to being modified on personalized content for the individual. If you wanna focus on how people are psychologically flexible at work, modify the instructions to our open-ended opener to our scale and say you want them to choose in the domain of work what are some personally meaningful goals you've been working towards pick the most meaningful one all the subsequent items will relate to it we think our scale offers some um, some improvements to the measurement and thus the science the body of science itself and program evaluation to actually uh, properly assess the targets of intervention. If we're going to have a replicable science, a generalizable science, to have a field of science where we can be confident in the findings, measurement is at the foundation. Let's not just throw things out there quickly to get publications. Let's spend the hard time collaborating in large teams over years to get this right because the cost of thinking we know more than we actually know is problematic. And I think um, this plagues the field of psychological flexibility. And we're hoping that this is somewhat of a solution and we hope people build off of our findings just as we've built off the findings and the amazing um, ideas of Steve Hayes, Kelly Wilson, and members of, uh, of the community of social psychology researchers studying emotion regulation and clinical psychology researchers focusing on process-based therapies. Thank you for listening. And if you wanna, um, if you wanna download the 2020 publication in Psychological Assessment, it's available on my website, toddcashin.com. Click on the menu bar, go to publications. Even better, click on the, on the menu bar, the area on measures. You can not only download the article, you could download a Microsoft Word document with the measure that is modifiable so you can modify the instructions to exactly what you're studying. All we ask in return, keep me posted on what you discover, email me, find me on Twitter, look forward to hearing from you, and hear people's thoughts about what they discover and find out. As we learn about um, the nature of well-being, high levels of functioning, and help reduce suffering in humanity. Thank you.